Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. It's great to be at Chowdean, it really is. Um, I love coming to church on a Sunday, and I go to a lovely church in Sunderland, but Chowdean will always be my home church. It's a church where I was brought up, and I love the people in this church, and I love what it stands for, and I love coming home. I love coming to Chowdean to preach, and it's actually a real privilege for me today to be able to bring some of my friends from Sunderland to meet some of my friends in Gateshead. You know, it's a lovely morning. Family have travelled from all over to see Dad, and I think it'll be a real blessing for him this morning. We've tried to keep this top secret. I don't know how it's worked, but we've tried to keep it top secret. And just to see some of his family here uh, from around the country, it'll be a real blessing. My dad will love you being at church this morning. This is a place he loves. It comes every Sunday, and he's been part of this fellowship, certainly as long as I can remember, um, from being a child. So thank you for coming to the this people, you know, who've made a lot of effort, some from uh, a couple of hundred, um, I was going to say miles, a couple of hundred yards away in our family. Peter and Marnie have come from Lobley Hill, so thank you, Peter and Marnie. But there's people travel from further afield, and uh, it's lovely just that you've made that effort to come from all over the country. And lovely to see David this morning, my friend David, I grew up with David, and he's come all the way from Bahrain. Well, I think he was here anyway, but it's just lovely to see you. David. And uh, it's great that my friends from the Soul Kitchen have been able to come as well today. They've been allowed across the border today. They've had their passports stamped. And we just want to say to you guys, welcome to the promised land. (laughs) And today's reading is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 4, just three verses. 1 Samuel chapter 4. And these are the words. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. Now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. And the Israelites camped at Camp Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphok. And the Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. And when the soldiers returned to Camp Ebenezer, The elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that that it may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you'll add blessing to the reading of your word this morning. We just pray that we'll take that message. It seems quite a depressing message, uh, the defeat at Camp Ebenezer. But we just ask that you will bring it a message that would bless us this morning. And we pray that as we read this word, we'll respond to it and be obedient to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when I was a young lad, on a Saturday afternoon, I used to love going to my Uncle Basil's and Auntie Dorothy's. You see, Uncle Basil and Auntie Dorothy had a TV, and we didn't have a TV at home at this time. And so we'd go around and see Uncle Basil and Auntie Dorothy and Pam and Peter and World of Sport used to be on in those days. Do you know if you can remember World of Sport? And the wrestling would be on with Giant Haystacks and Big Daddy and Kendo Nagasaki. And I used to love it when Kendo got thrown out of the ring. He had the mask on, didn't he? And I used to love it when all the old ladies in the front row with the handbags would be beating up Kendo Nagasaki and trying to pull his mask off. And I've got memories of uh, those Saturdays Many, many years ago, I think we used to hide behind the settee when the Daleks came on the TV. And I have this memory as well that we used to bounce, bounce around the, the living room on Peter's Space Hopper. And uh, they, that just sticks with us. But obviously we stopped doing that when I got to 18. So <laughs> it was great times. But Uncle Basil will not know this. But he instilled in me a lifelong love of sailing. I remember Uncle Basil giving us A magazine, I don't know where he'd got it from, he'd probably never remember it, but it was the Yachton Monthly magazine, which I'll still have in the house along with me hundreds of other uh, sailing magazines. 
And in that magazine, there was a story about the O-Star. The O-Star is the observer single-handed transatlantic race. And I always remember reading about this 30-foot boat that was going to be converted to sail across the Atlantic. And this man who was going to sail it. And I've been hooked ever since. I've loved sailing all my life. And I've sailed sailing dinghies since I was 17. I love sailing. And the sailing dinghies I've sailed, I've sailed sailing dinghies from 10 foot up to 24 foot. And they've always had a tiller on them. Just sitting there, been out sailing with my friend Robert before, Bob before, and uh, others in the church. And it's just great fun. Uh, I've always had this ambition. It's always been on, people have bucket lists, don't they? And I've always had the, this ambition that I didn't just want to sail a boat with a tiller. I wanted to sail a boat with a big chrome wheel. I don't know if you've seen these ocean-grown boats with big chrome wheels. And I've always had this ambition that I would love to sail a boat like that with a big chrome wheel. So it was an amazing privilege of August of last year, just five months, six months ago, uh, to go sailing on an ocean-going boat, a boat that has crossed the Atlantic on a number of occasions. And now Fiona had arranged this trip. Uh, she had hired this boat and, uh, for some of the lads from Soul Kitchen to put a crew together from Soul Kitchen just to help us to have ambitions in life and to think about the big things we could do. And so we got a crew of uh, lads and girls together and we spent a week sailing in the Mediterranean. Uh, sorry, I'm starting to wander a bit there now. In the grey North Sea, I'm afraid. But this boat, 67-foot boat, had a big uh, steering wheel. And I was looking forward to going on this boat with this crew, the morning star of Revelation. And because all the lads were from Sunday and the girls were from Sunday, we thought no better place to start than on the banks of the Tyne. Oh, that, that's not on the banks of the Tyne, but that's where we started. We started uh, under the bridge on the banks of the Tyne. That's where we set off from, from Newcastle, just so they could fill the lungs with the air before we set off. And it was a, an absolutely amazing uh, week. Our skipper was a lovely man called David Shepherd. Now, David is a man of many parts. For two days of the week, he's a vet. And then for the rest of the week, he's a part-time minister in a church in Oxfordshire. A lovely man. But David also liked to indulge his passion for sailing. And quite often, he'll take chunks of the year, and he'll go sailing, skippering large yachts like the Morning Star of Revelation. Chunks of the year, he'll take people like me sailing and blessing people. He sailed thousands of miles on oceans. He's a professional yacht master, the highest qualification you could get. He knows how to read tide tables, how to navigate with a chart. He understands the wind and the movements of the wind. He understands how to plot courses and allow to compensate for tides and strong currents. He understands the hazards that are under the water, even though you can't see them. He knows how to read the chart, and he knows what's there. He knows how to get boats and the crews safely to the destination. And David was our skipper, and I was so pleased that he was. He was a gentleman, a lovely man. He wasn't a shouter. He had a quite a quiet voice, but he had absolute authority on that boat. He was the skipper. And he's told us we'll not do our own thing. We'll just do as the skipper asks us. It was a great week. It wasn't the best of weather, but it was just a great week of working together. On the last day, we set off from the port that we'd been moored up in. We set off just after midnight in the the pitch dark. We had to make an early start because the last leg was about 100 miles long. And there was going to be a long day of sailing ahead. And I just knew there would be opportunities to have a go on the big chrome wheel. And inside me, as we set off that day, I was absolutely buzzing. I really was. And it was an amazing day. The weather was fair. Had a beautiful sunrise. And it was 4-7 in the North Sea. A good, strong, constant wind. And there was a good swell in the sea. And there was white caps on the waves. And we were heeled over, 
and it was a big two-master boat, and it had seven of its sails up, and we were cutting through the water, absolutely perfect. The boat was just straining at the leash. And the waves were crashing over the boat, and I'm at the wheel. I'm at the wheel. And it was just an amazing sensation, the fulfillment of my ambition, and I was just absolutely over the moon. I'm in control. I'm in charge of this boat. And the skipper had said to me before he went down below, he says, Jeff, I want you to steer 143 degrees on the compass. Compass is right in front of you, just in front of the steering wheel. Big compass. The degrees are there. And that's all I had to do, steer at 143 degrees. And then the skipper went back to, down below, out of sight. And I'm the boss. And it was great fun. And I thought, you know, I'm going to use my little bit of knowledge that I've got of sailing. I'm just going to tweak it just a little few degrees. We always think we know everything, don't we? I'm just going to tweak it a few degrees and see if I can get a bit more speed out of this boat. And there was a little speed log just to the right of you. And I could see as I just tweaked it a few degrees, the speed started to go up. And I was absolutely elated. And I thought, like, they'd all been said about what the fastest speed had been. And you know what lads is like? You always want to be the fastest. And I thought, I'll see if I can get this thing a little bit faster. And I tweaked it a little bit further. And Kim, who I hope was going to be with us this morning, but Kim uh, was sitting on the side. And Kim's got a big happy face and a big smile. And he was sitting there on the side and he was egging his on. He's egging his on. Come on, Jeff. Come on. You're nearly there. And you know what it's like? I'm easily led. And I just kept going. It's Kim's fault. It wasn't mine. You know what it's like? The adrenaline starts to flow. And I'm just going with it. Tweaked it a little bit more. Flying along. And I forgot that down below, the skipper, who you couldn't see, but I forgot that down below, he had all the information that he ever needed. He had his screen in front of him. And he could see exactly what was going on up above. He could see exactly the direction that I was heading in. The setting that I'd put the airship on. He knew that the speed had started to go up. And he knew that upstairs, someone was being disobedient. And it wasn't long before his head popped up the hatch. And he says to us, Jeff, you might be going the fastest, but you're going in completely the wrong direction. <laughs> he said, if you keep on this setting, Jeff, you're going to end up in an offshore wind farm. So he says, please get back on 143. And so I just switched it back onto 143. And you know, as I put it back onto 143, I realized then that actually I wasn't in control. I just had the privilege of being on the helm for that half hour. And for the next half hour, all I had to do was be obedient to the quiet voice of authority. And so for the next half hour, we flew effortlessly along, the spray just bouncing across the boat as we headed safely towards our destination. And in that half hour, I started to realize that there's something quite exciting about being obedient. There's something actually really quite exciting about listening to the quiet voice of authority. Something quite exhilarating and quite stimulating and quite intoxicated, intoxicated, can't even say the word, <laughs> intoxicating, to just listen and to be obedient to the voice of authority. Freedom is found when we are obedient to the quiet voice of authority. You know, at the end of a perfect day, we motored, in, motored into our hull, into Hull Marina, and we got safely berthed up. And all the crew, the soul kitchen lads and girls, we got out onto the floating pont pontoon and we give a round of applause for our crew and for our skipper who'd got us safely home. You know, since that trip that I so enjoyed and I was so privileged to be part of, a simple truth has started to cement itself in my mind. I've been a Christian for 40 years, four decades. I gave me heart to the Lord Jesus four decades ago. He's my friend, and he's my savior. And I promised that I would follow him. That was the promise I made, that I would follow the Lord Jesus. 
And I've got to tell you this morning that the satisfaction in my life, the enjoyment in my life, the fulfillment in my life as I've journeyed with Jesus has come when I've been obedient to his voice. The times that I've messed up is when I've steered my own course. And that quiet voice would speak and say, Jeff, just get back on the right course. The great contentment in my life has come when I've been simply obedient to the Lord Jesus, to the quiet voice of the lovely Lord Jesus, to realize that I'm not actually in control on this journey. I'm just privileged to have a higher voice and a higher authority leading me. And he's led us in some lovely places. He's led us by still waters and green pastures. He's refreshed and renewed my mind and renewed my spirit. And he leads you in some lovely places. And he all he asks is that would be obedient to him. The times when I felt vulnerable and felt in danger is when I've set my own course. The best has been when I've simply been obedient to the Lord Jesus. I just want you to hold on to that picture in your minds for a moment. There's a lovely story in the Bible about one of Israel's leaders, Samuel. And Samuel was recognized as one of Israel's great leaders. He was a judge. And the Bible says that he judged fairly and dispensed God's laws impartially. He was recognized as a prophet. He foretold the Lord Jesus, the coming of the Lord Jesus almost a thousand years before he came. And he's recognized as a prophet in the book of Acts. He was a good leader. And he almost begged the people of Israel to set a good course. He would urge them to follow God's ways, to turn away from the course that you've set, turn away from your false gods, turn away from your idolatry, and get your life set on the living God. He begged them, serve only the living God. And I have absolutely no doubt that the people of Israel heard the quiet voice of authority from Samuel. You see, it tells us in chapter 3 and verse 21 that God revealed himself to Samuel. And in the next verse, in chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, and Samuel's word was spoken to all of Israel. The people knew exactly what God wanted of them. And my mind has no doubt at all that the nation heard the quiet voice of the Lord through Samuel, but decided instead to do their own thing and to not be obedient. To steer their own ship, to set their own course, and so it should not be any surprise to find themselves in choppy waters and heading towards the rocks. The Lord had told them the course to set, and they decided completely, I'm going that way. And so in chapter 4 and verse 5, we see that the nation of Israel was in shipwreck and chaos, a period of abject failure and sorrow. The nation's enemies, the Philistines, we read there, they came up against Israel at Camp Ebenezer. Camp Ebenezer was such a miserable place because it became a place of defeat. The people went out from Ebenezer, And they were defeated by the Philistines. The Philistines routed them. And we have a vivid picture in that passage that I read to you of the people being routed by the Philistines. 4,000 soldiers killed in one day. The people that were left went back to the camp. And rather than recognize that they'd been totally off course and out of step with the Lord, They decided instead to blame the Lord. Why did God bring defeat on us? He told them the way to live, but they went their own way. And yet they still thought, why did God uh, uh, bring defeat on us? And so they had this secret plan. Let's go and get the Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of God is. And let's bring the Ark into the camp. And let's use the Ark as our secret weapon. Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant, they said, and it will go with us and it will save us from the hand of our enemy. And so that's what they did. And that was the next wrong step. Because we read in verse 4 and verse 10 that the defeat of Israel was huge. 
that 30,000 foot soldiers were killed and the ark was stolen because they decided to live in their own way and go their own direction. And you can go to Camp Ebenezer and it'll be a scar on Israel's mindset. It's a scar in Israel's history, Camp Ebenezer, a place of sorrow, a place of death, a place of defeat, a place of embarrassment. Camp Ebenezer. In your mind, you've got this picture of a defeated people, a humiliated people, and all because they'd been disobedient to the quiet voice of authority. They decided to set their own course and should not be surprised. It was complete disaster. And they ended up on the rocks. Ebenezer evoked bad memories for the nation of Israel for generations to come. Bad memories. You know, experts say that our memories are really good at remembering bad stuff. Not so good at the good stuff, but really good at remembering the garbage and the bad things. We remember bad things easier than good things. And that's why I can't remember what I did on the 10th of September, 2001. I cannot remember what I did on the 10th of September, 2001. I haven't got a clue what I was doing. But I will never forget, as long as I live, the 11th of September, Tuesday, the 11th of September, 2001. I can remember exactly where I was. I remember what the weather was like. I remember the people I spoke to that day. And I remember the horror of the Twin Towers. I'll never, as long as I live, wipe out the memory of that day. Because that's what our memories are like. We remember bad things. And the horrors of Camp Ebenezer cannot easily be wiped away. It's a dark scar that was etched in the memories of Israel. Bad memories are hard to erase, hard to wipe away. Bad memories, bad things that happened in the past keep us trapped. They keep us in dark places. They think that's, we think that's where our destiny is. They always stay in those dark places. There'll be some folks here this morning who are trapped by bad memories. Trapped by things that have gone on in their lives. Some folks who find it hard to move away from Camp Ebenezer. I've always lived in that place of defeat. That's what happens. It's just life. That's what happens. And I struggle to move away from it. I meet souls every day in our church who live in Camp Ebenezer. The defeats they've experienced in the past scar them and hurt them. And whatever it is, Just bad things that have happened in the past. It could be addiction. It could be anything. It could be abuse. It could be a bad relationship. Just negative memories. And it seems to hold on to them. And it seems to have a destructive hold on them. And this force which they can't be free of. And it doesn't matter how often I say to folks who live in Camp Ebenezer, your past shouldn't decide your future. Your past What went on before shouldn't decide what goes on in the future. There's times it seems like I'm wasting my breath. And that these people are never going to be free from Camp Ebenezer. It seems in the natural that they will never break away from Camp Ebenezer. And from that place of defeat. It would take a miracle to set them free. But I know a man who works miracles. I know a man who can change defeat into victory. I know a man. I'm nearly finished. And I just want you to stay with us for a few more minutes. Because we turn to 1 Samuel chapter 7. And the Israelites are still there. And it looks like the same pattern of defeat is still going to go on. The Philistines in chapter 7 and verse 7 are coming up to attack the Israelites. In the memories of what happens, we always get hammered off the Philistines. We always get hammered off these guys. And it says that all Israel 
was afraid. But this, this time, something different was going on. Something different had started to change in the mindset of the Israelites. It, said, it, it, it says in the scripture that they'd realized the error of their ways. They'd realized that their ways were fraught with danger. And it says that people had repented and come back to God. They'd changed direction and come back to God and had returned their hearts to the living God. And that's exactly what it says in chapter 7. That the people set a new course. They came back and listened to the voice of authority and started to respond in obedience to him. It says they left their false idols and came back to serve the living God and him only. The course that they'd been on, they reset on a new course. You can call that repentance, a change of direction. You call it that if you like. A change of direction and following God's ways. To recognize that you were wrong and to come back to that new way. They recognized they'd sinned against God and they asked Samuel to pray for them. And Samuel sacrificed a lamb for them and prayed for them. And we see something amazing in chapter 7. That the defeat that they'd experienced was going to be changed to victory. It says in verse 10, and I've highlighted this verse in my Bible because it's a really important verse. Chapter 7 and verse 10, it says, But on that day, but on that day, it's a verse that's full of purpose and full of hope and full of promise. It says, On that day the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines, and he threw them into a panic, and he routed the Philistines. And the towns that had been taken by the Philistines, they were taken back and were restored to, the Israel, to Israel. The surrounding territory was given back to Israel. And it says throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. There's victory in obedience. There's victory on resetting the course according to the voice of authority. And it says in chapter 7 and verse 12 that he took a stone. He took a stone. I don't know what his stone looked like, but this is my stone. This is my stone. He took a stone and he gave it in the name. He called it Ebenezer. And he says, I raised his Ebenezer. And he banged it into the ground. And he says, this far, this far has the Lord brought us. He's brought us from that Ebenezer place of defeat. And he's brought us to a place of victory. I believe that God changes defeat into victory when we hand it over to him. He says, this far, the Lord has led us. It's not because of us, but this far, our skipper, the living God, has brought us to this point of victory. I love that story in the Old Testament. I, my mind works in pictures. And I could shut my eyes and I could pick this stone up. And I could imagine Samuel standing there before the people with a big stone and hammering it down on the ground and saying to the people, this far the Lord has brought us. And here I raise my Ebenezer, that great song that we used to sing years ago. The rock of help. You know, it would be a great sadness this morning if you left that story in the Old Testament pages and saw it only as ancient history. Because this story is for, day, for today, in 2020. I can look back over four de decades of getting up in the morning and just listening to the quiet voice of authority and seeking to be obedient to the voice of the Lord Jesus. And I can say today, after 40 years, I can raise my Ebenezer and I can say, this far the Lord has led me. This far the Lord has led Jeff Foster. I didn't get here by myself. It's by the grace of God. My dad's journey started almost seven decades ago. And he was a drunkard. And on a wrong course, heading for the rocks. There's no doubt about it. 
and he was in a little cafe. You've heard his story many times. He was in a little cafe. Late night cafe, waiting for a taxi home. Drunk. When this lovely man, Alan Wharton, came in and stood next to him and opened his Bible and read the words of God. And the voice of Jesus started to speak into my dad's life. The quiet voice of authority started to speak into the life and mind of Derek Foster. And then Alan didn't just leave it there. And he got my dad to go to a little tent in the bottom of the gate set. And a group of people got up, young kids, got up and sang the song that you soul kitchen guys have sang this morning. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find Jesus. And that little song spoke into my dad's life. Oh, I love him. Yes, I love him. Since he bled and died for me. And the quiet verse, v- words of Jesus, the voice of authority, started to filter in to the minds of a sinner and a man who was lost. And he gave his heart to the Lord. I know him by the nail prints in his hands. The Lord Jesus who died on a cross of Calvary for us because we're sinners and we're so far off course. We needed a saviour. And he came and died for you and for me. And he was put dead into a tomb. Put dead in a tomb and the tomb was sealed. But on the third day he was raised to life. And he's alive today. And he lives in the hearts and minds by his spirit of men and women and young people, just like you and me this morning. And that day in Gateshead, in the gospel tent, something changed. But this day, something changed. In the mind of Derek Foster. And he changed direction. And he started to set the co- go on the course that the Lord had set for him. To live no more at Camp Ebenezer in defeat, but to come to a place of victory. Because we have a God who changes the darkness and the defeat into victory and hope. We have a God who gives us a future and a hope in him. And each day, my dad, and I can vouch for this because over the years, I've lived and I've worked with him. And each day, my dad would get up and he'd seek to be obedient And to follow that course. And he didn't always do it well. And there's times when he went off course. As we all do. And you've just got to start listening for that voice again. And getting back onto the course. That will bring you home. And after seven decades. My dad. Can put a landmark down to deer. And say this far. The Lord has brought. Derek Foster. I didn't get here by myself. This far, he's brought us. And so it's not an accident that my dad's here this morning. It's not fate. It's not the look of the draw. This far, the Lord has brought us. I wonder this morning, could you raise your Ebenezer? Could you raise an Ebenezer? And put it down and say, this far the Lord has brought me. Have you been on a journey with Jesus? Because if not, why not start the journey with him? You know, it's wonderful the journey with the Lord Jesus. That old song, here I raise my Ebenezer. Here by thy great help I've come. And I trust by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. You know, I don't know what the future holds for Derek Foster or for Jeff Foster or for you. But all I know is a bit further down the line, I might be putting my marker down saying the Lord's brought us this far. But I just know whatever's in front, the best is yet to come. Why not start the journey this morning with the Lord Jesus? Listen to that quiet voice and simply respond in obedience to him. You could start to listen to that voice. I don't know if you 
in a habit of doing it, but you could start to listen to the voice just by picking up a Bible or a New Testament and just starting to read it. And that just like Alan opened his Bible for me, Dad, and simply let the words of God just start to filter into your heart and start to start a journey with Jesus, who to know is life eternal. I'm just going to pray. Father God, we just thank you for your goodness to us this morning. I just thank you as the crew of the uh, Morning Star of Revelation stood on that floating pontoon at Hull Marina and just applauded the skipper for getting us safely home. We just want to applaud you this morning, Lord Jesus, and say thank you that you get us safely where we need to be. Lord Jesus, I pray that every person in this place this morning would just think about you and be prepared just to open their minds to what the Lord Jesus has to say. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that it's been a joy, an absolute joy in my life, just a journey with you. Thank you that you saw fit to save a sinner like me. And thank you that I have the privilege of every day getting up and being led by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Lord, we worship you this morning. And we love you. Amen. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk and please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes. 